Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to, to be hosting this fourth uh, part of our Meet the Law seminar, uh, which is on labor in the meat industry. And I'm happy to welcome you here uh, this Monday afternoon. I will just, before passing the floor directly uh, to, to the speakers, I will be uh, I will be happy to say a word on the on the middle loss series. So uh, the middle loss series is a similar series that uh, is organized by uh, my colleagues and the Center uh, for Transformative Private Law at the Amsterdam Law School. Uh, that really tries to unpack different uh, uh, aspects of the relationship between law and particularly private law and uh, meat production. Um, so the meat production overall has been critiqued from different aspects and we've managed to cover uh, the, some of those aspects in our previous uh, similar sessions. So we spoke about um, meat and finance or financing meat production. We spoke about labeling and consumer protection. And now we speak about labor. Uh, labor and the meat industry has been a, an uh, aspect that has been in the focus of critique uh, for a long time, but has particularly come to the fore during the pandemic. Uh, as uh, still, uh, even as we are speaking, news are coming about mass infection outbreaks in meat processing factories and slaughterhouses. And uh, uh, these uh, basically events are often connected to the uh, uh, working conditions or the living conditions that uh, migrant workers are facing uh, at these meat processing facilities or uh, or slaughter uh, houses, and this has been the case not uh, particularly in the Netherlands or in one uh, particular space, but it has been occurring in different countries uh, around Europe, also in North America, as we will see in today's uh, in today's picture. So uh, today, the idea of the of the panel is to really talk about the causes or uh, the structural preconditions for the exploitative working conditions and the degrading living conditions in uh, meat processing uh, factories or uh, in meat production around Europe and in Canada in particular. Uh, so uh, I will not uh, take much uh, more of the time. I will just briefly introduce our speakers who will, in, who will talk about different aspects of the relationship of uh, institutional and legal structure with the uh, pro problematic of working and living conditions in, uh, in the meat industry. So I will briefly introduce uh, the speakers in the order of speaking in today's seminar. So first we have uh, Sarah Berger Richardson, who is a an assistant professor at Ottawa University School of Law. Uh, Sarah is teaching uh, uh, food law, civil liability, and administrative law, and her research uh, interest is particularly focused on the regulation of uh, um, the food sector in Canada, particularly uh, farmed animals and meat processing. Our second speaker is Terife Errol Fogel. Terife is researcher uh, at the um, um, uh, VST uh, as the uh, Research Institute of the Hans Brückler uh, Foundation in Germany, and she's also a lecturer at the Bochum University, and her research focuses on work transformation and industrial relations, uh, particularly in Germany. Uh, our third speaker is John Klein. Uh, John is a uh, union, uh, trade union leader at the Dutch uh, Trade Union Confederation. And uh, he is, uh, uh, his focus of work is the meat uh, industry itself, and he's president of the pension fund uh, in the meat sector. Uh, and our final speaker uh, is Professor Tesselche Delange from Radboud uh, University. Uh, she's a professor of European migration law and director of, migration, of the Migration Law Center at the Radboud University, and she's been in charge of a research project on migrant uh, mobile workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And part of the results that she'll be uh, presenting today are uh, drawing on the work done in this project. 
So uh, without further ado, I will uh, pass the word on uh, Sarah. So Sarah, uh, the floor is yours and uh, you have around 10 minutes and I'll, I'll give you a sign when it's two to 10. Great, thank you. Thank you, Vladimir, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, so I'm joining you, I work at the University of Ottawa, um, but I'm joining you today from the unceded territory of the Ghanaigahaga. Uh, many of us refer to uh, Montreal um, as our home, but it's named Jochage. So it's always been a gathering place for many First Nations uh, and continues to be home to a diverse population of Indigenous peoples. Um, and so I'm happy to be on this panel um, and really delighted to see this topic receiving the attention it so urgently requires. Uh, and I'll begin with a reference to uh, a Montrealer who is more famous than I am, uh, to Leonard Cohen uh, and his song Anthem. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the lyrics uh, that he writes, where he writes that there is a crack in everything and that is how the light gets in. And so my sense is that um, the pandemic has really been that crack that has brought some attention to the meat industry that many people have been interested in for years, but the idea that the general public has become more interested in the situation, uh, the labor situation, the injustices in meat processing facilities um, was really brought to light. And there's an opportunity from the pandemic to um, give it more attention. Uh, and to examine it further. So with the time that I have today, um, I'll be brief, but I wanna speak briefly about the impact of uh, the pandemic on the meat processing industry in North America so I can bring that perspective to the table um, and then share briefly some post pandemic. Um, I don't think we can really speak about post pandemic, but kind of post the, the initial uh, outbreaks in facilities, how there have been other labor disputes that have been ongoing in Canada. Um, and then talk about, uh, I guess, my, my hourglass theory of meat processing and the idea of concentration in the industry. Um, and finally, I'll speak briefly about how uh, shifts in uh, food safety governance in Canada uh, towards outcome based regulations um, may be encouraging problems rather than uh, solving them. So to begin the pandemic, um, the numbers, uh, we've kind of seen outbreaks uh, around the world in the US, just you know, for, for context. Um, the most recent numbers suggest that uh, upwards of 60,000 uh, meatpacking workers have tested positive for COVID-19 um, and that at least 298 died. Um, these numbers come from the really important work of Leah Douglas at Fern News, who did a really Herculean job of, of gathering these numbers. In Canada, we don't have uh, the same uh, kind of rigorous numbers, um, although I did have two of my students who were working last year with a not-for-profit to keep track of media reports in an attempt to get a sense of those numbers. Um, and they had tracked as of February 2021, uh, 3,776 3, positive cases and nine deaths. Um, and one of the largest recorded outbreaks in North America was at uh, a facility in Canada in the province of Alberta, where 950 cases were reported um, at that facility alone. So we know that the numbers are, are, are worrying, um, they're tragic, and they are ongoing. Um, just this week, there have been more reports uh, of outbreaks in, in North American facilities. Um, but I want to also kind of talk about another part of the, the impact of the pandemic on these processing facilities, and that's um, in terms of the numbers and the backlogs with animals. And so for the most part, you know, there, there were a lot of criticisms of facilities for not shutting down or not reducing uh, line speeds to enable physical distancing. Um, and that was certainly a problem. But there also were facilities that did close down. There were temporary closures. Um, and there were line speed reductions, which resulted in bat backlogs. And I think just one of the things that I want to just put on the table, we don't have time to really get into it, but in the same way that we don't have a clear sense of the numbers of individuals who contracted COVID, um, because those numbers aren't released um, and they're not required to be published, we also don't really have a sense of kind of the, the consequences of these backlogs on uh, numbers. So on the one hand, we've heard a lot from uh, the, the meat industry, from the beef industry, from the hog industry, from the poultry industry, 
that these backlogs at facilities were going to result in um, millions of animals being culled or euthanized because they couldn't get to the slaughterhouse. At the, and, and some of that is true. There were you know, many that were that were culled, but at the same time, now kind of with the hindsight of a year and a half, we also know that um, hog slaughter in Canada increased by 4% um, in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, and there were, the industry found workarounds and producers were able to send their hogs to another province or um, to the United States for slaughter. So there seems to be a bit of a, um, there's, there's a lack of information to really find out what the threats or the warnings about euthanasia, if they actually map on to what was happening on the ground. Um, and in many cases, it seems like the industry was able to um, adjust and potentially also to increase line speeds uh, in order to make up for slowdowns uh, that happened early on. Um, and for example, in the United States, there were at least five uh, poultry plants that were granted uh, waivers to increase uh, line speed production to 175 birds per minute. Um, so at a time when people were really calling for reductions, uh, line speeds were, were increasing. So there's kind of some, some confusion about numbers. And I think that's something uh, that warrants our attention and I'll kind of explain why in a few minutes. The other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, because these are recent developments happening in Canada, there were two highly publicized labor disputes um, that took place at two different uh, meat processing facilities in Quebec. One was a hog meat processing, processing facility. One was a poultry meat processing facility. The first strike was for the poultry um, facility and it lasted one month. Um, it reportedly resulted in the euthanasia of more than uh, 1 million chickens in Quebec. Um, but at the, at the end of the strike of the one month strike, uh, employees were able to negotiate a wage increase of 20% uh, distributed over five years. So this was something that received a lot of attention um, and caused a lot of concern uh, because of the impact it was having on supply chains because producers couldn't um, get their chickens to the kind of, in many cases, one and only facility that could take their birds. Um, and then pretty much within a few weeks, there was another uh, labor dispute at a hog facility. Um, the Olimel is the, is the company, um, and this one lasted for four months. So this one received a lot of attention. The provincial government got involved. There was a lot of pressure to come to uh, an agreement. Um, it took quite a long time. There were uh, warnings from the industry that 180,000 hogs would have to be euthanized or at the very least that farmers would be stuck um, sheltering them and feeding them and potentially having to send them further away to be slaughtered. Uh, and it was about 1,000 workers who were on strike um, at a facility that normally processes 35,000 uh, pigs every week. So these are big numbers. Um, but in the end, the uh, agreement was that uh, the workers negotiated a 26% uh, salary increase over 10 years. So all of this um, to say that kind of the, the, the pandemic, but also these labor disputes have highlighted um, one of the, the weaknesses or a, a challenge within the industry. And that is that the industry um, has become too big to fail. Um, and Kind of with with similar um, kind of with kind of echoes of, of the financial crisis, and that's something that we see. There's so much concentration um, in one facility that uh, a labor dispute or kind of um, health, occupational health and safety concerns can have an impact on the entire industry. Um, and I'll just conclude with um, one last thing that I wanted to mention about uh, how I want to connect this to food safety gov governance more generally. So Canada, like many other countries has been shifting towards outcome-based regulations and its food safety um, inspection requirements, which means that as long as a facility um, implements preventive controls that mean they can achieve desired outcomes in terms of microbial safety, the industry is kind of free to do whatever they want in order to achieve that outcome. And for the most part in food safety governance, this is seen as a good thing. It's about you know, providing flexibility and freedom to the industry to do what they need to do to achieve the outcomes. But I just want to leave you with you know, an analogy and something that I think is um, of great concern, but not receiving the attention that it needs and that 
is kind of like the highway safety code or whatever you call your highway uh, safety regulations um, in, in Europe and different countries. But the idea being that we don't set uh, speed limits or we don't set, uh, especially in construction zones when we have warnings to slow down because there are workers around you. We don't set the guidelines to say that as long as you could arrive at your destination without killing yourself, we don't care what you do. Right? We, we set highway speeds, we set all the rules about slowing down, we set all these things because we know that it's not just you and whether you can get to your destination or not, but also because we're concerned about the safety of construction workers around you. We're concerned about the safety of other vehicles on the road. We're concerned about all the other people around you. And there seems to be a disconnect right now in this shift towards outcome-based regulation in terms of thinking about the end objective of microbial safety, but not thinking about all the other things happening at the food processing plant, the meat processing plant that are also of concern, that's animal welfare, worker safety, and those things aren't being considered. And so um, I know that my time is up, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but it's just something I wanted to leave um, you to think about and we can talk about it more uh, during the discussion. Thank you. That was great, Sarah. Thanks so much. I think my brain is still buzzing from the numbers, but I'll, uh, I have, uh, I guess, some time to, to process this. Uh, I will pass the floor uh, immediately to, to Serife, and uh, yes, Serife, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vladimir. And also, thank you for the invitation. I'm also thrilled about being here and discuss with you all the issues which are really important also in Germany. and. Today, I'm also going to show you what's possible, um, like building in combination with the liberal market strategies or uh, policies and combination with institutional um, or low institutional power of unions in Germany and also specific sectors. Um, and also like um, in uh, absence of state regulations. And I'm speaking of the subcontracting system here in Germany. I'm not so sure if uh, all of you are um, familiar with the with the uh, subcontracting system here. Uh, I'm going to start with um, with my uh, presentations and also give a. Um, I'm not so sure if it's works. I'm so sorry. I just try to give my present desktop free and it should be shared. I hope everyone can see my uh, presentation. Yes, yes. Okay, that's yes, we can. That's great. And um, yeah, I've been studying the labor relations in German meat sector since 2016. And um, I want to speak about the uh, subcontracting system here in Germany and how it could be possible to build in combination with the liberal market policies on one side and also uh, this interest of the state to regulate one sector on the other side. And um, I'm going to give um, like an overview about the subcontracting system here in Germany and also the recent developments of um, or especially the renewal of the Occupational Safety and Health Inspection Act. And to sum up, I'm going to uh, discuss if it is the turning point in Germany for the labor relations in the sector or not. And, uh, but I wasn't so sure about if all of you know all the subcontracting system and what I'm here uh, talking about, I want to give just brief overview about this process, then uh, we all can understand the same con construction, what is it. And here's the contractor who has the big work or project, which is more than what the contractor can achieve or can manage on its own. Therefore, a uh, contractor can, um, like um, hire a specialist subcontractor via a service contract for uh, this workload and subcontractor provides a service under a contract for 
uh, under a service contract for a contractor. But um, it's important to know like the subcontractors and contract workers are not the part of the business of the contractor. They don't manage or supervise them at all. They don't provide any instructions on how they should perform their work or have line management responsibilities over subcontractor. And it means subcontractor works independently and also they are liable for success of the services that they are providing uh, for contractor. Subcontractor hires their own contract workers who are uh, execute actually the instructions of the work of contractor. In um, the case of meat sector here in Germany, the uh, contract workers are directly working at the places of the contractor. But as I mentioned before, contractor has any responsibilities for those contract workers who are working in their facilities. An example could be like a designer may give the subcontract uh, like a logo design uh, task to another graphic design. It doesn't seem like it's a, a negative thing. And maybe one might uh, ask, what is the problem to use a service contract in the meat sector in Germany? I want to give a brief overview how it is implemented in Germany. I want to start with 2014 because it is one of the most important date in uh, German subcontracting system. At this point, it has started to change. Here we have German meat sector and the four uh, most important countries from Eastern Europe where uh, the majority of the workers, migrant workers come from. And till 2014, subcontractors were was um, migrant or foreign companies who posted workers from their country of origin to Germany. In the European Union, the citizens have also the right of free movement of workers. So it means they can work wherever they want as long as the job stays in um, European Union. This had been also used um, ex um, this had been used extensively in Germany. The majority of the workers at meat companies was post employees and uh, they get paid actually only the wage structures of their home countries. It meant only three to five euros and they had no social security in Germany. If they get become ill, it meant um, that they got deported to their home countries. And there was hardly any collective agreements or co-determination in Germany. And also accommodation was only possible in mass housing for migrant workers. In 2014, we saw uh, three radical changes. First of all, it was the first collective agreements in the sector in 2014, which regulated the minimum wage. And also the meat sector has been listed in the national acts, which regulate the minimum working conditions for posted workers. And of course the companies knew like starting from the 1st of the January, 2015, there will be a minimum wage in Germany, which came into force. And it was no um, point of using posted workers anymore. So they decided to end this posting system. Let's go one more time to the top to see how it changed um, till 2020. Here we do have again German meat sector and gradually all the subcontractors registered till 2017 in Germany and they hired their contract workers from also their country of origin, but this time the contract workers were directly integrated in the German labor system. But still, they weren't part of the big meat companies and they were still the majority of the, um, of the employees in, big, in the meat sector. But the, most importantly, they were also part of the social security system in Germany. And I guess it was the biggest change um, since then. But um, reporting, reports from the labor inspect, inspections showed um, fundamental breaches like extensive working hours, more than 16 hours per day, 
Non-compliance with mandatory rest periods was so usual for meat sector and also unpaid, unpaid overtime so they could um, undermine the formerly paid statutory minimum wage in the meat sector. It was a big step actually to stopping costing um, from the Eastern Europe countries, but it is still, um, it wasn't not the change the sector has needed. As the COVID-19 pandemic hit the sector, the, the working and housing conditions was um, so bad and it also fostered the um, um, spreading the, the, the pandemic and um, thousands of migrant workers, I guess almost 6,000 was in Germany, unfortunately infected either at work or at home because in both places it wasn't possible to keep social distance for the workers. Over the course of 2020, repeated outbreaks uh, of COVID-19 in several German meats processing plants led to legislative renewal in Germany. And I would say it was the second turning point also for the meat sector and its uh, labor relations here in Germany. And the law is already in force since 1st of January 2021. And um, yeah, it's subcontracting in the meat sector, which was so usual, is prohibited from the um, January 1st. And the only usage of temporary agency employees is allowed if the uh, companies are binded with a collective agreements at the sector. And this supports, of course, the increase of collective agreements in meat sector. And we do also see that like uh, now working time must be recorded digitally. It would be harder also uh, um, using working time fraud. And um, it's also most important one is the, um, introducing minimum standards um, for the workers' accommodation. It's the question, is it a turning point for the labor relations in the sector? I would say since the announcement of the renewal, there is a prospect of profound change in employment practices. And uh, we see like uh, since June, there is a new minimum wage collective agreement at the sector. And there is many ongoing negotiations for in-house collective bargaining agreements. And many companies have started already hiring their contract workers and they are buying or building for better housing conditions, which was necessary. And maybe one of the most important items, the uh, migrant workers are allowed to vote in works council's election because they are right now part of the uh, companies and they are regular, regular workers for them. And it would lead also increase of workers voice which we all um, expect. For me, those are the signs of, or for fundamental change in the labor relations. There's still um, much to research about it, how good it will be implemented in the sector. There will always be like um, a gap for the companies that they can use it. Therefore, we should uh, keep eye on it. But I believe there is a chance that uh, it can become or uh, meat sector can become an example how highly deregulated sector might be re-regulated again if uh, the necessary institutional support provided. And we can also learn a lot from the development of the labor relations in the sector for the sectors where there's still the same structures are observable. And it was my last sentence and thank you for your interest. Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much, Terufa, and thanks for for staying really within the 10 minutes, as Sarek has done before. So we are uh, uh, moving forward to the third presentation, and I will just invite John to okay. have the floor in his 10 minutes. So thank you for the invitation. I have to warn you, my, my English is probably good and sometimes bad, uh, so I do my best. Uh, I want to uh, ask my colleague uh, Imke to start the presentation. Okay, well, this says uh, Sean Klein, director in the meat industry, nice title, of course. Uh, I did it uh, for the last 20 years, 
So I've seen all the changes, uh, which uh, which uh, the last speaker also uh, 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 said. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is an uh, an article. Uh, I, I wrote an opinion in the in the Dutch. Uh, 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 is that, uh, uh, paper, Dutch paper, and actually we want uh, uh, to try to, to, to achieve the same result as uh, in Germany, because that's the main, uh, the, the, the biggest solution that the migrant people are working uh, in the slaughterhouses themselves. And uh, it's, not, it's not right uh, to make them subcontractors uh, again. Next, please. Imke. Yeah, I will tell you about uh, the situation in uh, in in the Netherlands. You uh, ben een te ver, Imke. Sorry. <laughs> Paused, like always. Uh, oh, oh, oh. So, 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 so. Okay. This one. Well, when we're talking about the meat industry in the in the Netherlands, we are talking about pork, beef, and veal. But actually, it's the same situation as in poultry. Work is very hard. It's, uh, has changed over time uh, because uh, about 10, 15 years ago, you you really saw uh, 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 skilled uh, uh, people who are really butchers are working in the slaughterhouse. And, and when we see it uh, 15 years later. They simplified the work, so yes, every worker has a has a, a, a simple monotone task, uh, which which uh, as goal that everyone can do the work. And when every kind of one can do the work, they you can and exchange the people very quickly. Uh, for instance, they are working at twelve thousand people in the meat industry, uh, and we have every year two thousand changes. So that that's because the the people don't like to work. Well, when when it, the work is very monotone uh, and simple, you can uh, pay that badly. Well, these are the 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 the, the, the earnings we uh, have in the collective bargain for the whole sector. And the problem is they they start with ten euros to uh, sixty eight on this moment, but it's all uh, uh, they they never rise. So they, they are uh, paying, uh, for instance, uh, when you work seven years in the, in, in the industry, you have to earn 30, 39, but, but they exchange the people every year so they can't reach the higher level of salary. And, uh, and also the higher level of salary is not much, is also not much. Now work is very precarious uh, in always in precarious situation. Next, please. And what you see, and that's the policy of the sector, is that they uh, replace the normal workers for migrant workers. The normal workers, uh, let's let's call them the Dutch workers. They are are the skilled uh, uh, butchers. They are going with retirement, and they will change uh, uh, change for a, a, a very cheap migrant. As a, a normal uh, butcher, uh, uh, an employee earns about uh, 18, 20 euros an hour, and they exchange it for uh, one, uh, they can pay uh, 10, 10 euros to 68. And when they're younger than 21, they can pay less. Well, what I said uh, about uh, 12,000 uh, uh, employees in the, in the sector, and uh, 7,500 of those uh, employees are, uh, are already migrants, and the number will increase. And the only Dutch workers in the sector you see on, 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 uh, on the office, on the te technical uh, apartments, uh, main maintenance, uh, I mean, I mean may maybe the transport, but not on the slaughter uh, working place themselves, not on the cutting place themselves. Now, migrant worker may, uh, kijk hoor. Uh, now, one of the problems is natuurlijk that, that, that uh, the, the local workers can't communicate uh, with the migrant workers. So 
the, the Dutch people don't want to be uh, want uh, to to work anymore on a normal working place because nobody uh, they can speak with nobody. Uh, okay. And the migrant workers, what I said is uh, they they are used for the the simple and very hard production uh, work. Yeah, all Eastern European countries are represented. It's the same list as the, the last speaker. But I know factories with uh, more than 40 nationalities. Just the people are going from Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Bulgaria Romanian, but also from Northern Africa, uh, Spain, Greece. We see everyone. Well, then we have uh, the rules. I, I will tell you about the rules in the meat sector, and then I tell you about the reality. And the rules is the paper. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that you all uh, uh, know the rules, but uh, then I will show you the reality. We have a collective agreement, uh, agreement in, the, in the sector uh, for all the workers, including the migrant workers. So that is no, no problem. So we have a nice book with all the rules, with the working hours, with the, 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 the salary, with uh, all their rights. But that is the key question. They have a lot of rights, but how can, can they go to, uh, get those rights? That's the, that's the, the key problem. Now, migrant workers, uh, uh, oh yeah, and uh, as a result, they are also inflated to to flat. We have a pension fund in the in the sector, it's a very good pension fund with also uh, an insurance when they when they die here that the the, the, the people who are in the homeland uh, also get uh, a lot of money. This is, this is a good good uh, uh, pension. Uh, now. Uh, migrant workers uh, live in house, housing facilities that are certified. I always uh, uh, always laugh when I read this because when you read the certify, uh, certificates uh, which are uh, the housing are uh, 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 and when you see it on paper, well, you would uh, uh, want to, to live for yourself over there. Uh, and when you see the reality, uh, uh, well, then it's very terrifying. Uh, the employers recruit the people in the home country, and they uh, they have a, a lot of box with uh, fairy tales. Uh, so they come uh, in Romania, in Poland, in Bulgaria, and then they they uh, promise the people uh, a good a good job with a good housing and a good salary. Uh, but what we see is when the people come uh, to Holland, that one key uh, a key moment is the first paycheck. When they uh, receive the first paycheck and they see what they earn, but what they uh, have to pay to taxes, to the for the housing and other costs, and they see what they earn, but what they really uh, uh, get, that is a very a very big uh, difference. And uh, and they go uh, go away to the to their own country. Okay, uh, go further, Imke. Now, when we go to the practice, then uh, then is the problem that we have a lot of rules, but in practice, uh, the the people don't see, uh, 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 don't get the rights, and because when they complain, they get they get uh, uh, they get fired, or when they complain, they were sent to to another slaughterhouse. So nobody. Uh, nobody wants to complain and everybody is afraid to complain. And there is a lot of snitching also in the system. So when somebody says uh, uh, that, that, that there are problems, well, he will uh, move to another other slaughterhouse and problem solved. Now, when you see out the, the working hours, these are not the working hours, but they have wake up uh, uh, 30 about uh, uh, after four in actually night in the middle of the night and then when they come back uh, the, the day is uh, well they, they, they have about 40, 14 hours uh, later privacy is very difficult because uh, they sleep with three two three uh, 
of more people in the room. And that's why I'm very happy that we had COVID because uh, this is a situation who is uh, also, well, the last 20 years, never, but COVID changed it. We're now in the, in the Netherlands, we have a discussion that any, every migrant has the right to get his own room. What a, what, what a result, huh? Okay, was it Lorraine? Uh, okay. Oh, and what would, do we do? Uh, I lead a team in the meat sector from uh, the union. I've got a Polish colleague, I've got a, uh, a Romanian colleague. Uh, uh, and we, yeah, we, for years we have providing information in four languages. Uh, and we just want to say uh, to the people what the rights are, but the practice is there are two freight to get for their rights. So that part of the uh, uh, labor situation must change. And we are now, uh, as we speak, we have, uh, uh, we went to the Minister of Labor in, uh, in Holland and we demand that FNV, our union, uh, gets access to the working floor because they are uh, putting us out at the working floor. Because when, when we can talk to the people, we can explain what their rights are and then yeah, then we can start a fight. Uh, yeah, that's. Had I nog een? Was er nog een input? No, this was it. This was it. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so we hope that the people are working uh, in the meat uh, industry or get a member of the union because when they get getting member of the union, we can help them, and we've got a lot of power, but only for union for members. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. This was uh, this was really great. Uh, we'll I'm sure there are uh, questions uh, later in the discussion. Uh, for now, we'll just uh, pass the floor to uh, Professor Tesselche de Jan uh, Janga for the Langa, sorry for for the next uh, ten minutes. Yeah, no problem. Um, I I have a new microphone. Do you hear me? Yes, yes? we okay. hear you great. Okay, good. Um, right, so what I'm going to do is actually um, uh, skip through my slides because I think John very uh, well described a lot of the stuff I wanted to say about, about the Netherlands as well. And I want to pick up um, on some of the issues that Sarah brought forward, which sort of, um, um, well, take a helicopter view of, of the sector as well and the, the too big to fail uh, issue and I think that should lead us nicely into to the discussion on on these fascinating presentations and practices. So so why am I talking about this? Um, first of all, let me see if I can move the slide. Go oh, yes. Um, so this is my team. We are a two-year research project team, interdisciplinary at Rabat University and the Burgt. And Bert, um, that's Lisa Bernstein and John. Uh, uh, well, you, you and her are well acquainted. Um, uh, working for the labor unions as well. And what we do is an interdisciplinary study, multi-level, um, different perspectives, civil society, employers, and migrants on um, essential sectors: migrant workers and COVID. And our essential sectors are the meat sector, distribution and services, and then specific cleaning. And then we don't just look at EU nationals, what we've been talking about so far, but our project also considers undocumented migrants and how they went through COVID. Um, but for now, uh, I, I focus on the meat sector, which obviously was right from the start out there as a sector that, that called attention. As was said, um, um, uh, 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 you, you, you put it really nicely, Sarah. I think it was you, like, like the, the, the crack, the light. Um, uh, <laughs> COVID sort of opened up, not our eyes. I think everybody present here sort of was aware of the problem way before we had COVID, but COVID opened other people's eyes and that's useful. Um, so what did we do, or are we still in the process of doing, to study the situation? Um, a lot of methods used, and for now I can only present the um, uh, personal questionnaires, at least the preliminary 
uh, findings. Um, and actually, it very much overlaps with what, what John said. I will get back to that in a moment. This slide is just a quote from an investigation, but it was in, in 2018. To, just to, to stress that prior to COVID, there was already quite some awareness, uh, but not to the bigger public, of the problem. Um, this is an interview with a, um, a food safety inspector um, and who says, well, you know, it's just impossible how fast the processing line um, uh, is, is running. Uh, they're speeding it up again and again. And as a um, food safety inspector, um, this person said, I cannot guarantee that the meat going to the consumer is safe. And actually what we saw during COVID is that it was to a certain extent, the, the, the um, uh, food safety inspectors, because like John just said, the, the labor union can't enter the, the work floor, can't enter the plants, but the food safety inspectors have to be there because otherwise you shut down your plant. So it is actually them who signaled the, the issues um, that were that were there and what was wrong. And although they were there for the for the animal safety, they actually also had a part to play in the in the worker safety. Um, I, I find that quite cynical, but um, I'm happy that they did. Um, but it, it, I think it goes to show the um, uh, uh, to the complexity also of the legal framework that we are working with here. So it's not just worker rights, it's also the food uh, security. And um, um, uh, like, like Sarah said, you know, the, the, the um, backlogs of, of animals being um, transported, uh, being slaughtered, et cetera. There's, there's a whole system behind it. And indeed, I saw that also in the Netherlands, um, but, but John, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that weekend shifts are, are back on and that people are really working a lot of hours to, to work on these backlogs. Um, so this is, this is just a, um, some of our findings, which, which fit nicely with what John just said. So uh, we did um, um, a questionnaire with um, um, EU migrant workers from Poland and Romania. We had 153 respondents, 53 working in the meat sector. They all have temporary work contracts. Only seven poles had a more steady contract. Um, they don't have steady hours, so they, they never know when they're going to work and how many hours. Um, 40 say that their work hours are guaranteed, but eight don't know. Um, so I think that's also exemplary of people working in the sector who are just not really aware of their rights. And this is also in the next question, within how many days can your contract actually be terminated? And then 16 say that they actually have no clue about the termination of their contract and, and the terms. And another important issue uh, that Sariv also already addressed is, is, is the living, um, uh, living conditions. Um, uh, it's most often arranged through the temporary work agency. And uh, like John said, people have to leave home really early. And that is for one, because they can't live near the plant where they work. Now, this is something that we ha I haven't heard mentioned yet, but on, on the note that it's such an intertwining of legal fields, here it's also very important that we look at the environmental laws for municipalities, the rules that they say on, on construction of, of housing facilities, etc., and the not in my backyard uh, citizens who like to have an economic endeavor in their vicinity. Although I'm not sure if anybody likes to have a slaughterhouse in their vicinity, but nevertheless, the economics is good, but then they don't want to have the people who actually have to do the work live in their village. So it comes to also municipal and provincial and regional laws on what kind of business do we attract and what requirements do we set when somebody opens a plant for whatever it is, whether it's distribution or meat, do we also set requirements on accommodation so that the people who need to work in this plant can actually live nearby and don't have to travel an hour and a half, get up at five o'clock, etc. So this is really, I think, a core element in the debate on how to go forward 
um, is that we sort of have this whole of government approach where you see that it's environmental laws, it's food safety, it's animal safety, it's worker rights, um, consumer rights po possibly, huh? because as a consumer, you, you also want to know what's, what's on the table if you still have meat on the table, that is. Um, I guess the people who are into this topic find it um, less interesting to eat meat eventually. I mean, that's my experience. The longer you study it, the less <laughs> attractive it seems. Okay, so from a legal perspective, um, what does our research so far show? Well, on an EU level, we had at the beginning of COVID clear guidelines saying, okay, intra-EU mobility um, needs to, thanks, needs to um, be facilitated and food production, including slaughtering animals, was part of the essential work that needed to be facilitated. So borders remained open, workers could come. What happened in the, on the Dutch level? Um, well, actually not that much. We had a lot of interesting reports written. Um, the the um, uh, task force uh, rumor on the, on the uh, protection of migrant workers' rights said some very interesting things. Everybody sort of agreed across the board from, from unions to employers to a lot of politicians said, yeah, this sounds good. And that was last October. And then of course we had elections and then like nothing happened. Um, but there's also a strong focus on saying, okay, let, let private sector do it. And you've heard the unions and you've heard the challenges that they face. And the sector that says, oh, you're hurting us. Um, it's unfounded complaints, it's inappropriate, we worked so hard to get the food on your plates, etc. So don't blame us. From our study, it does show that they really try to prevent the uh, contamination, the outbreaks, out of their own interest, obviously, because closing down hurts business. So they did try their best to, to live up to the standards. Uh, but you can seriously question from a bigger point of view, if, if that's enough. So who cares? Final slide. Um, what we saw is that the crisis was not an opportunity in, in the European context so much for regulatory change, not so much on the national level in the Netherlands, like in Germany. That was a very interesting development. Um, I have a kid coming in. Ik heb nog één minuut om te praten. Dan <laughs> die moet ik even vol praten. Um, where was that? Yeah, so the crisis, what's happening? What we found very interesting right now, and we're part of that problem, is that there's research and research and research going on. So we got money from the government. Another organization got money from the government to study this phenomenon. But all these studies are not amounting to any change. And this is sort of like the state of ignorance we're in. It's not ignorance as we don't know that this is happening, but it's ignorance as to what action shall we actually take. Let's do another study and postpone any serious decision. And what we also see is that on the ground, there's a crisis of enforcement. Like John said, the labor unions, the shop stewards can't enter, but labor inspection is just as insecure on going into these plants as well. So way forward, going back to what Sarah said, the bigger picture, um, uh, and um, I saw some people who are uh, Laura Burger. Um, uh, hey, when, when we talk about climate change, you talk about urgenda. Uh, what, what can we take from that? Can is there is there because it is really also a climate problem that we have such huge animal plants. So if we cut back because of climate reasons, what does that do for workers? Does it help? Yes or no? So I'm really curious if we can sort of cross across these disciplines and um, uh, improve the the sector, make it smaller, make it safer, make it better for the people who work there. Um, the German example, that's that's the second bullet point. Social impact analysis is one that I really like, is that municipalities step up um, uh, their game and start saying, not, not in my backyard or in my backyard, but completely well organized. Um, inspections, of course, could be, that's a very on the ground. So I'm sort of going from, way up there, climate change to really the small stuff, just don't announce your inspections, uh, social uh, employment agencies go in and announce, but 
apparently that's tricky. Mm. And I hope that the other solutions will be out here and that we maybe can get to them together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you too, so much, so much, Tesla Chair. And it was really great that you uh, referred to the other presentations throughout your own. So it kind of very nicely connected to the points that others were making and adds very nicely uh, on that. So I, I believe that many have already some questions. Uh, I think this was really incredibly insightful uh, line of presentation. I really enjoyed every presentations with the very rich insight the four of you have offered, how Sarah very uh, vividly managed to capture the workload that uh, meat workers are facing in meat processing facilities and how it, uh, that increased even further during the, during the pandemic and how actually it was easy to do so uh, due to the regulation situation in place. And then uh, Serife uh, also offered really uh, a great, uh, um, basically outlined very much how through particular contract structures uh, that were in place over decades in Germany, he have created a particular subject of the meat worker that was uh, uh, the meat worker as the Eastern European worker, the posted worker from the European periphery, prone to exploitable working and, and degrading living conditions. And uh, John and, and Tetelche's presentation, both in the Dutch context, uh, brought also further insights, uh, very much building on what's been said uh, in the earlier two presentations, but uh, very much bringing an, another point, which was the uh, enforcement of labor rights or who can reach out to these workers, what are the problems the unions are facing on the ground and as uh, Tesla during the presentation referred. So what, how can we act through, uh, through regulation, to interference in the institutional and the legal setup, through enforcement? Uh, it's, a, it's one of the, one of the big questions uh, right now. So without further ado, I will open the question, uh, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Please just raise the, uh, your hand, and I will uh, I will call you uh, so you can uh, ask, ask the question directly. If you don't have a possibility to speak, just write the question in the chat, and I'll read it out loud. So if you have a question, please. Also, the panelists are allowed to ask questions to each other, uh, of course. Okay, Laura, I think you raised your hand or yes, no. Thanks. So, okay, wonderful. Well, thanks a lot for this wonderful afternoon. I really have learned so much and I enjoyed all, uh, all the presentations. I have a small question for Sarah. Probably I just missed what you said there, but when you were discussing those two controversial cases where, with the strikes, you mentioned that it had a huge, that it was also controversial because it had this huge impact on the supply chain, etc. What I was wondering, because later on in your presentation, you also mentioned animal welfare. What about indeed these in, in huge numbers of euthanized animals and how was the reaction of the animal rights movement in Canada to that? And then just shortly, because Tessa men, men, mentioned me, I'm not sure, but perhaps this is something we should think about further, whether litigation, climate change litigation could actually solve the issues with labor. So I had once a student writing on a possible climate liability of the meat industry. But one, I th one of the issues I think is that there's not a clear actor responsible for all of the meat industry. So the question, who are you actually going to sue is already a very hard one. And then indeed, I think climate wise, a response could be, a, yeah, to make the meat industry smaller, but that wouldn't necessarily solve the issues for all of those workers. But that's very not uh, answer to that question, and perhaps there are uh, possibilities to think about further. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Laura. I would prefer to collect a few questions and then have uh, one round of answers and then a, another round of questions. I have three further. Uh, so I will uh, give the floor to Maria. 
Uh, hi. Uh, so also, my thanks to all of you uh, for wonderful presentations uh, um, and really thanks to, to the organizers for actually putting together such a nice, nice combination of, of talks. So thanks a lot. Uh, um, so I have a question uh, uh, with regard to the um, criminal law uh, and the exploitation uh, uh, Provisions that are usually part of uh, all criminal codes. So recently, in the in the in the Netherlands, uh, there was a situation a situation of exploitation or something that looked very much like exploitation in the transport industry. Um, yet the ministry or the public prosecutor has uh, uh, has refused to act on that uh, because the, the the standards of proof uh, uh, were not met uh, in a way. Um, and so the question is, you know, are there such cases, uh, uh, criminal charges um, coming up in, in the meat industry? Is, and is, uh, is the, the, the FNV, so the, the trade unions, are they try, uh, thinking about this path uh, of action um, uh, and so forth? So thanks. That's a great question. Thanks, Maria. So I'll take uh, one uh, question. So we have a round of three questions. So I will give uh, the floor to Andrea, who is the next one. Hi, thank you for your uh, very interesting presentations. I have a question uh, about the Canadian case, because uh, uh, I don't know if uh, it, it uh, depended on uh, the short time for presentation, but, uh, but uh, when uh, Sarah talked about uh, strikes, uh, um, bargaining in uh, Canada, it uh, seemed uh, to me that uh, it was uh, all about money. I, I mean, uh, um, that the bargaining uh, uh, realized uh, uh, wage increases, uh, but uh, were uh, organi organization norms and uh, uh, speed the process, uh, production process uh, uh, were not uh, put in discussion. So. Uh, I don't know if uh, it depended on uh, the short time of presentation, but uh, uh, maybe there is uh, an issue about the uh, union uh, strategy in Canada about uh, uh, worker re uh, regulation, and uh, I would like to ask uh, this uh, thing to Sarah. Great, thanks, Andrea. Maria, I see your hand is up. Uh, do you have a follow-up question on, or it's Oh, no, I'm from... struggling with my computer. Sorry, I'm ah, going no to worries. remove myself. Okay. I can always come back uh, in, but uh... <laughs> no worries. Uh, I can. Uh, okay, then uh, well, I'll take in Serifa's question, and then we'll go with the round of answers. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, I have actually two questions. Um, first of all, I I'm so interested to, to know if the subcontracting system, I'm not so, so sure if I have missed this in other talks, um, if the subcontracting system also part of the meat sector in also Canada or in Holland or in Netherlands, that would be interesting for me to know um, if the same system will be implemented in uh, like in different countries, is it like the char characteristics of a sector? It is like as usual how it's supposed to be. That would be one point what I'm interested in to know. And the second one, I'm interested to, to hear how you see the changes or renewal in legislation here in Germany. Um, uh, Germany was always like the uh, bad country and has always done something really nuts um, how to say good for the sector and also for European Union, for the other countries. And is Germany right now on the right path? Can we say, is it something that we should um, also see in the other countries in order to regulate meat sector, not only in national level, but transnational level? That would be really interesting for me to hear your view of point. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Serifa. Uh, I will suggest that, uh, so now each speaker also in the, in the same order as you presented to just address the questions that have been uh, referred uh, directly to you. Sarah, you can start. Uh, Great, thank you. These are all such great questions. Um, so uh, I'll try to be brief. In For Laura, so to answer your question, I think that the strikes, but also the slowdowns and the pandemic, both have had really significant impacts on animal welfare, 
what I kind of wanted to bring up in the presentation was maybe to problematize some of the ways in which threats of euthanasia have been mobilized by the industry. So on the one hand, there are definitely, there, were, there have been cullings that took place in Canada and the US, you know, quite a few of them that um, raise really significant animal welfare considerations. I know that one worker, um, kind of in terms of undercover uh, investigations, someone who did film um, that the euthanasia of hogs in the US was subsequently prosecuted. Um, so there's a lot happening on that side. The other side, though, are threats about, you know, the pork industry was constantly during COVID and also during the strikes kind of threatening that they would have to kill all these pigs, you know, neglecting that they were going to kill them anyways, just differently. Um, and so trying to kind of get the public's support um, so that seemed to be sometimes disingenuous, but at the same time, even if they're not culling them during those two weeks or three weeks or, or four months, there are also animal welfare concerns because they've outgrown the sizes of their pens. They might not be kind of fed properly. And so keeping them um, on the farm, especially for chickens, when you know we know that they just will collapse under their own weight once they reach whatever three month point. So anyways, so there are lots of animal welfare concerns that definitely have come up and euthanasia is, is one of them. Um, but I also wanted to just flag that um, sometimes disingenuous using of it because these numbers don't always map out. So we kept hearing these threats and in the end, there was never any proof that that had um, happened. Um, I'll say just very quickly that um, in terms of criminal charges, I think it's a really interesting question. This is Maria's question. Um, the High River plant in Alberta, where there were 950 cases, uh, the, the police did have launched a criminal investigation into that. We'll see what happens, um, but that's kind of the one and only criminal investigation. Uh, it seems that kind of in the U.S. civil liability is being used more kind of for, for negligence, but the kind of criminal negligence that doesn't seem to be as much except for, um, to my knowledge, the case in, in Alberta. Um, the question, Andrea's question about strikes and what was being negotiated, I, I have to say that I, I'm not as immersed in the kind of into in the labor side of things, so I don't know exactly what was being negotiated. But I do think that the big thing was salary. I don't think that there was much room or space to negotiate or kind of talk about speed. But that's kind of basically, I think the 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 deal was we're trying to get better wages for the work that we're doing because you've seen how awful it is but the working conditions themselves don't seem to be as uh, front and center. And I will say that, and this gets to what other people have been saying, and so I don't want to um, speak for others, but I think it gets to this subcontracting issue. So according to many people um, who are more immersed in the labor side of things here in Canada, workers who are employed by meat processing facilities are actually, it's actually a pretty good job in terms of um, kind of employee protections and occupational health and safety, et cetera. What's not well taken care of are the workers who are coming from temporary agencies, right? Who aren't employed by the facility. So there's definitely a disconnect there. Um, and it might be that for those who are employed by the, by the facility, the big difference was, was wanting a pay increase, but not all of the other things um, that the other speakers uh, mentioned, and then those workers who are coming through the temporary agencies won't benefit from them because they're not um, employed. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I won't respond to Sarifa's question because I think that maybe other people have things to say and I don't want to monopolize too much, but I'll, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Sarah. Can I tell, uh, tell about uh, something in the Netherlands about the criminal law or do you want Yes, to go, go yeah. ahead. I don't think that uh, 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 try to use the uh, the instrument of criminal law law uh, solve any problem uh, because the employers are smart enough uh, to get away from that area. So what they do is there are a lot of rules and when they uh, they are sure that when they dive uh, under those rules nobody gets them. It's like uh, uh, driving to red but because there is no uh, police officer, uh, so they drive uh, every every day uh, to red. And when we uh, put uh, some police officer after uh, behind uh, the, the red light, then then they will stop. That is, in a sense, uh, how we have to solve the problems in in the in the Netherlands. There are a lot of rules, but we have to 
make sure that the rights who are uh, written in those rules uh, are, are, are uh, yeah, coming with, by the migrant workers. Another uh, problem is the low salary, because the salary is uh, that low. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, 10, 10 euros 68. Uh, they want to make a lot of hours. So the migrant workers are want to make a lot of hours, 60 hours a week, because then they have earn a normal wage. When we increase the wage, uh, then they don't have to make 60 hours a week. So when you give them 20 hours a year, uh, uh, a year uh, an hour, then they have to, then they can earn the same with 30 uh, in 30 hours. And one of the big solutions, and that's, then I question, uh, I'm, I'm answer the question about, is uh, Germany an example on this moment? Yes, Germany is an example in the meat industry because they got the guts to make the migrant workers uh, uh, part of the slaughterhouse and not from the uh, temporal agent agencies. And because the workers are now part of the slaughterhouse, they have a very better position to fight back. And that's what we see also in Germany. We have seen uh, uh, little strikes for solving uh, all kinds of problems. Because the, the biggest problem in the meat industry is the temporary status of the migrant workers and the fear they have that they lo lose the, the the, the less rights they have. So we have to, we have to uh, change the balance in power. The, the workers uh, has to, uh, have to, uh, yeah, must, must to achieve more power so they, they, they can fight for their own rights. And that's, uh, that's why we are trying to, uh, to make the, the same solution in Holland, but uh, that's what the unions will want, but uh, I'm very afraid we not succeed, uh, uh, but we try. It's a balance of power that's actually the, the, the biggest issue in, in this problem. Maybe anything you want to add something not? No. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, I'm uh, John's colleague, I'm policy advisor. Um, when I'm not helping John out with the uh, presentation. <laughs> but um, to answer the question, criminal law could be, um, um, could be a way out if it sets an example. But what we have seen, and um, um, the person who asked the question uh, raised the example of the transport sector, but that took almost three years to come to the decision to not prosecute. And that's the experience that we have, and I, I think Tessel, you also mentioned it, that enforcement is really a, a major issue, that non-enforcement actually is a major issue. So criminal law is not, well, it's not our friend in, 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 this, in that sense. Uh, there's one example, if you're interested in it, uh, it's the uh, strawberry pickers. And uh, in this case, it, an employer was actually, actually prosecuted. Um, that's um, that's to answer the question on the criminal law, and I think uh, the German colleague uh, asked the question about if it's similar here in the Netherlands with contracting and temp agencies. Yeah. It is. Uh, I'm not sure if you're all aware that there are 14,000 temp agencies in the Netherlands, and if we include all the contractors and the payrolling uh, companies, it's um, about two two. 22,000 agencies, so that's enormous, so that's very similar. But what um, the Dutch government keeps saying is that the situation here is so different that we can't have the same legislation as Germany has. But, well, in our opinion, that's nonsense, of course. So <laughs> that's Rather. just an addition to me. <laughs> Yeah, I have to agree with you, Imke, on, on that one. It's a little bit, I think, what we do have posting as the, um, uh, but it's a little bit different um, uh, from the German situation where it is in Germany, it's actually Romanian companies who sort of take over part or, or took over part of the plant and of the production line. Uh, while here the, the, the main um, uh, way to, to go is with a Dutch temp agency, um, but it's, it's a mix. So it's, it's, I think it's all happening. 
But um, one of the things that, that makes it quite different compared to, to other countries probably is that uh, we don't have a permit system for the temp agencies. So we could all together start a temp agency tomorrow and try to make some money out of this. Um, and there is really no requirement um, uh, other than a registration at the Chamber of Commerce and a tax number, and we, we can start making, making money. And that, has, that is one of the core ideas of, of uh, one of the, uh, of the task force last year that said, let's regulate this. But then they said, let's, let's do it privately. Let's, let's work with certification and that oh, they only accredited. And then there is another private accreditor who has to check whether people have. And I personally think it's, it's a very um, difficult public private sort of instrument that they designed and i'm just saying hand out permits or not and enforce permits so i'm i mean uh, i can be pretty liberal but here i'm thinking um make it <laughs> make it just a government rule <laughs> with a permit system yeah. and enforcement um uh, because i don't see it happening this private accredit accreditation etc so so maybe that's just a note to add but indeed, enforcement is, is the big problem. And Sarifa, that, that would be a question for me to you. Um, uh, for future research, it would be really interesting to know whether the enforcement now is better in Germany, because also on the new Housing Act in Germany, which is a formal obligation to provide proper housing, while we all have this informal blah, blah, whatever, can the German municipalities um, uh, the, the, the Kais and, and whatever, do they have enough people and money to actually afford, enforce proper housing? I don't think I had another question, right? So I'll shut up again. Yes, I will. Uh, we have, uh, we're almost at the end. So we'll just collect one last round of questions. I have Maria. Uh, would anyone, anybody else like to, to ask a question? Maybe. Okay, Ther Therifa, yeah. uh, Could I uh, uh, comment directly the question which uh, Tesselje just asked me? It would be it would be great if I can uh, give my comment. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Go go ahead. Thank you. Um, I find it really interesting to hear from also different countries how the system is there, how how it's working, and like the changes here in Germany can be. Um, a good example and it's I'm really happy to hear this one thing what I want to state like here in Germany what is what could be the difference we do have here one um, one project which calls fair mobility I'm not so sure if it's um, so well known for all of you they are like working so many hours to inform migrant workers about their uh, rights. I guess it is a problematic here. You can make the legislation, you can have the rights, but if you don't know and if you don't pursue them, they don't help you. And um, I guess it is the biggest part here, like they enforced uh, state with their findings or uh, they just challenge every company's, meat companies here, uh, with they just informed the migrant workers. That could be one step. Maybe what what is here in, uh, in Germany works really good. But the enforcement, I believe, it would be also really challenging here in Germany. Even with the new legislation, I guess that is only five percent of the whole meat companies will be um, controlled each year, yeah, yeah. I guess, and it means only 13 controls every year. And I guess it will be still so low. And I'm not so sure where we should uh, take a look how we can enforce better the rights of the workers. But I'm not so sure if it could be like we are, um, um, what is it? We are state and we do really have interest also follow those enforcements how it's going to change here in germany and we also uh, going to have further um, research 
in meat sector, and um, I would be really happy to share our research uh, results maybe in the future. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks so much, Terry. We we'll still have a few minutes, so I'll just collect the final uh, questions. I have Maria, I have Dion Kramer, and I have the questions from Mirta, which I'll read out loud. It's a question to John. And uh, Mirta asked, uh, perhaps stupid question, but he said you can only do something for the workers if they become members of the union. But isn't the CLA also applicable to non-member workers? If the employer is part of the CLA, uh, is the is, is the collective labor agreement? I assume the, the acronym. Yes. Okay. So that's Mirta's question. So Maria, please, I'll just collect them, Maria, and then Dion, and then we'll go with answers. <clears throat> uh, thanks. Uh, so I have a question about. Um, so why is it that we know so long that that there are such big problems in in all kinds of industries which are populated by migrant workers, and so little effective regulation? You know, it, it's there are many other sectors where we are, and in the Netherlands, in Germany, in many other countries where we can actually enforce what we uh, what we want to enforce. So I wonder whether the problem ultimately is also not that there is so little, basically, um, interest in the. So there there is very little. Uh, um, uh, a political demand for such protection in the sense that, you know, the, who is, you know, who is there to who really care about what is happening to migrant workers, except for the labor unions, uh, and then a couple of academics. So uh, story tells us you have an important role, but, you know, in, in a way, there is very little uh, uh, political draft luck, basically, yeah. uh, or, or kind of urgency to solve this issue, because um, ultimately, you know, you get, you get the benefits, you do not feel the pain, in a way. Uh, um, and so, it, and they even thought like about very stupid thing in terms of kind of rights, you know, so like with passengers, uh, the, so the, the um, air passengers rights, you get whenever you fly a small flyer, this is these are your rights. So we have been able to do that with regard to air passengers. Why don't we have such, you know, obligation that anybody who is ever posted or crosses temporal agency gets a list of, you know, just information about the rights. Now, of course, so if you have sufficient, uh, uh, um, sufficient number of people who actually uh, know about the rights. I do think it shifts a little bit, little bit the balance in terms of. Uh, so if you have only a couple of people who uh, know about their rights, the fear pertains. But if you have kind of a generally spread understanding what the rights are, I do think it that little bit changes ch changes the, the balance and eventually opens up uh, people more to kind of uh, collectively do something about it. So through labor unions or just you know talk more about it and and eventually do something about it. So um, yeah, that would be my question. Great, thanks, Maria. And the last question uh, is for Dion. I mean, by Dion, <laughs> and okay. then we'll go with. Yeah, I, there are so many things to discuss. It was a very fascinating panel. Um, I'll keep it as short as possible. And the point is the following: that uh, I, I, I think actually Tesla, you already raised the issue in the chat. It's the following it has to do with EU law, right? Because in a way, the German case. Uh, right, the prohibition of subcontracting, the requirement to hire workers permanently, is kind of a test case. Also for like the the the, the power of EU internal markets, uh, free movement law in a way. Right, what are the limits of what member states can do if they actually want to, and what are the limits in a way or the powers of the EU? You know, to say like, well, no, that's an interference with EU free movement law, because there are some lawyers, EU lawyers, saying like, well, this is a clear violation of EU free movement law, and others would say, well, there's a clear justification for this. So in a way, I think that's the point, right? And I think that 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 has, that's that reflects back, uh, refers back to the, the discussion about enforcement, because in the Netherlands, apparently, there's no political will willingness to actually enforce. Because their interests, their interests of employers, of the industry, of agricultural industry, distribution centers, etc. Right. So at the end of the day, it comes down to you know political economy, right, of, of EU free movement law. Um, my question is, in these like you know, um, the, it comes back to the question to Sharifa, right? It, to what extent is there a discussion going on in Germany about interference with EU free movement law? I would be extremely curious to hear about this because I think it will become a major test, a testing case. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Dion. And uh, so I will give the final word uh, to each of the speakers if you want to address some of the last points. We are slightly over time, but we began with a slight delay, so we can go 
a few minutes, I would say, over time, but not too long. So just one final comment, uh, each of you, if you, if you would like to, to address some of the issues raised in the last round. So you can also go uh, as you wish. So, uh, so as Terry Fair, I saw that you were ready to start. So just go ahead. I would like to. And um, I would combine both of the questions or um, comments from, from both of you, Maria and Dion. And um, to my knowledge, there is really several companies who um, filed, I guess it's called interim constitutional compliance. But till now they all dismissed, but I'm sure it is not final yet. There will be a really huge fight against this regulation in Germany and we are uh, observing right now and how it's going to be finalized. I'm also so curious about it. And I guess um, you will all uh, will read from us about this situation. And um, to Maria, as social scientist, and I'm also uh, working on organization so uh, sociology, and we should reframe um, how we enforce eigentlich, uh, actually the, the legislations if it's not through uh, political willingness, but what is our um, tools for this. We should know that um, all companies are not just there as actors, they are all embedded in society. If you and I or all other um, citizens doesn't see one act or uh, one political act from them, not correctly and assert their concernings, the companies are more or less at the end, they have to hear to us. And it's the uh, perspective of, organizational soci uh, sociology, like the companies cannot ignore their, um, how to call, um, their buyers at the end. And it is the biggest um, challenge, I guess, to, to realize this. Okay, the companies are embedded in society. If I change anything in society, it would also change the decisions or to actions of the companies. And from the unions, of course, there's the um, pressure on the companies, but you can also do as society so much if you change your expectations that would directly lead to changes also the actions of the um, companies at any sectors. And um, yeah, I, that would be also my last comment. I guess I also sum up all my ideas about the <laughs> changes in meat sector. Thank you. Great, thanks to Rifat. Uh, then I will pass the uh, floor to John and then Sarah and then uh, Tim. Well, the, the first question, uh, you can hear me or? Yeah, yeah. The first question uh, is when we have a result uh, uh, on the collective bargaining, the, the benefits also go to the to the not members of the union, uh, in theory. Uh, so uh, it's not that the rights are just only for the members of the union. The other uh, answer on, on all, almost all, all the questions uh, we've heard is uh, because nobody cares. Uh, why are those? Uh, why why uh, why do we see in the meat sector what we see? Because nobody cares. And then COVID came, and uh, everybody had to look because uh, all those migrant workers they are working with uh, uh, on thirty centimeters from each other. And when they have one and a half meter in the factory, they sleep uh, with three persons on an uh, on a on a room. And they travel with 10 persons in a car. Uh, so then it was a health problem. And it, because it was a health problem for the, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, it, it was a, a problem for the society. And when the health problem will be solved, everybody gets an, uh, how do you call it? An, uh, uh, a break uh, in a, um, uh, it's, it's... a vaccine, vaccine. The vaccine, that was the word I was looking for, uh, then, uh, then nobody cares anymore. And that's the big difference uh, and the big danger. And I, I really believe that we are now on a turning point. And the turning point should be 
that uh, the migrant workers are working on the slaughterhouse themselves, not but uh, we have to kill the temporary agencies because that's the uh, because the temporary agency everybody can can look away, and when they are uh, 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 working with the slaughterhouses, the boss of the slaughterhouses can't look away anymore, and that's well, and because the position of the migrant worker will be stronger then, then he can fight for himself and then we can help as a union and make the difference. Because it's all about money. Can I have one small question more? Is this a lot? About the EU. So what is the role? So in a way, I found it quite quite curious that the EU basically should is the kind of natural constituency of migrant workers, but ultimately you know, the, the, the whole posting situation is not like, there is very little protections for the posting workers. So now, of course, the, 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 the rules on, on, on uh, salaries have been uh, changed. But again, there was a lot of backlash from the from the posting countries, from the countries which, which export labor, if you like. So uh, so I wonder what you would see and how, what do you lobby as uh, for as FNV uh, uh, when it comes to the, to the regulation of this issue at the European level? Because that seems to be, you know... We, we, we lobby for the last 50 years for equal wages, for equal work. Uh, but the problem with the lobby is it's all paper and uh, and I'm a man from the practice yeah? so uh, it, it's it's very nice to written down uh, how much uh, money uh, somebody should earn but what do you do when he didn't didn't get it and why he didn't it don't get it it because it is an, a Dutch uh, saying uh, uh, you can't like have it is it's it's need to sell those like when you when you have the rights it will uh, you can't uh, but you don't get them yeah then you don't you have not have nothing and the union is of course an organization who can fight for those rights but because all the migrant workers are on temporary basis they're all afraid and how can you fight with uh, people who are afraid afraid to lose their house, afraid to lose their income, afraid to lose their uh, the, the job. Especially that they immediately end up on the streets. Huh? So yeah, that is actually a, quite in relevant. A, in, a nice box, in a nice box yeah, from uh, paper with yeah. a view on the, on the, the in Rotterdam. It was in the paper, so with a view on the mass. So in summer it was nice, but now uh, we're going to the winter. Yeah. With all the other problems there, yeah, because we have a, a big housing uh, shortage in uh, in Holland, so the the normal Dutch people who want to buy a house, they can buy a house because in the city of Rotterdam, where I live, forty percent of all the houses is uh, has been bought by the temporary agencies. Forty percent of all the houses, and that's driven the price from the houses. Uh, for, for the houses uh, above, but some it has to change, but uh, politically nobody cares because the market the market should solve all our problems. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, really not to uh, finish this seminar on this note <laughs> that the market should stop everything. No, I'm kidding. Uh, John, these were great points. But just not to end the seminar on a completely depressing note, I will just give the word to Sarah. Maybe she would like to comment on something that's been said, or that I cannot remember whether there were questions to address directly to you, but just not to exclude you from the, from the final round. So if you would like to comment, please go ahead. And if uh, if not, uh, we we are coming to a close. Um, yeah, just I, I don't know if it will it will end on a positive note, but I just wanted to end with maybe two two things that kind of came up because it came up in the chat, and I was interested in what Marco um, was writing about local employment. Um, so I just wanted to maybe kind of add a little bit more to what I had said in the chat about uh, Canada and North America, because I mean, for me, it's very interesting to hear about the, to learn more about the European context where you have people who have the right to work in different countries within the EU, but are still marginalized um, through their employment. Whereas one of the challenges uh, in the North American context, and I'll speak more about Canada, is that the people who are coming through temporary placement agencies are frequently um, undocumented migrants 
in which case, um, you know, and, and they might be given false names, false um, social insurance numbers to work. Um, and so the, the precarity there, even if the, the percentages might be lower than they are in the EU, the precarity is significantly increased because if you are injured um, on the job, you are not going to speak out if that's going to reveal that you didn't have the right to work, um, that you're using a fake name. Um, and so we have a lot, I think it's interesting to hear the numbers and, like, and the, the sense of what's going on in the EU, because in Canada, the problem is that we just have kind of no idea who they are is more anecdotal. And so that's actually something, a place where I think kind of more research um, is needed. And then just the last thing that I wanted to, to mention, because I heard that the, the importance of enforcement coming up again and again, and again, just to kind of share that, that concern about the outcomes-based regulation that we're seeing everywhere, not just in Canada, Canada is catching up to other jurisdictions. It's a response to the fact that governments don't have the money for inspectors. So it's, we're, we're changing models of inspection to have industry uh, regulating itself um, to achieve the outcomes that are desired without the prescriptive requirements and without having inspectors on the ground um, because there's a financial cost that governments are not um, willing or able to pay to have the inspectors there. So while everyone, while we're all kind of agreeing that inspection and enforcement is important, there's a real risk that the trends in the industry are away from inspection and towards self-regulation. And from what we're talking about today, we kind of, we recognize that if, even if that doesn't jeopardize food safety um, in the way that, you know, some might have concerns, it will have uh, negative effects elsewhere. So that's my really positive note to end on. Yes, thanks so much, Sarah, and thank you, John. Of course, you're both right. I mean, we cannot end on a positive note when we talk about labor in the meat industry. Uh, it's really, I mean, how can we do that? We cannot. But I think we can sort of uh, continue the fight. And I think this alliance between researchers and unions is hopefully promising. So uh, I, I'm really grateful to all of you who spoke today and all, all these great insights. I think it was really inspiring to hear about also the work John and your colleagues are doing on the ground. Uh, directly in the meat processing plants and the factories, but also about your research, Sara and Serifet Tesselche had to leave early, but also it was a wonderful, wonderful session, and I will uh, reach out to you for some uh, follow-up follow -up action. Uh, we, we should, in any case, sort of find a way to continue and bring forward uh, these discussions, but thank you so much for for today's uh, participation to all of you and thank you to the audience a lot for great questions because the discussion round was equally inspiring and illuminating so yes thank you everyone and see you in the next uh, round of meet the law